All right, well, good morning. Go ahead and come on in, grab a seat, uh, and hopefully you were able to grab a handout. Um, I apologize, I was a little late in getting those handouts out on the table, but they should be there um, now. So as we begin, this is our final week of this iteration of what does the Bible say about, um, and you guys have been kind enough to submit another uncontroversial um, topic that no one would ever get offended by. Um, I, Alexis and I were just talking this morning. One of my friends on Facebook saw some of these topics that I'd continue to teach. He's like, man, you're tr really trying to stir the pot. And I'm like, I didn't submit these questions, okay? I'm just trying to respond to them. So you guys just ask good questions. I'm grateful for that. You know what some of the more difficult passages are, and you ran to those. So I appreciate um, the level of competency of our congregation. Um, and I think that's proven in the fact that we, we always get really good questions for these. So this is the final one in the series. Um, I will say as we get to this question this morning, and that is what does the Bible say about women being silent in church, particularly looking at the passage of 1 Corinthians 14. Um, if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's where we're going um, this morning. Um, I will say as we get into this text, I think what we'll see, at least initially as we start working through this passage, is that the explicit exposition of this passage is not all that difficult and is fairly straightforward. Um, I think where it gets difficult is in some of the particular personal applications. Um, so is, in other words, I think the bones of what is being said is actually pretty um, clear and pretty straightforward. It's not necessarily popular in our culture, but it's not hard to interpret. Um, but it's getting into the particulars of the application of the principle. I think that's where it gets difficult. Um, and so we'll do our best to wade into those waters. But let me open before we go any further with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into it. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for allowing us to gather in your house on the Lord's day. Lord, we praise you that we do not come to worship a Savior who is in the grave, but as we will look at during our sermon, lo, you are risen, um, the grave cannot hold you, and you have been resurrected unto life, as is our hope as well. And so, Lord, we praise you for the resurrection of Christ. And, Lord, I pray that as your body, as being people of the resurrection to gather to worship you, we would be continually conformed into your image. And so, Lord, help us as we look at particular texts about how you desire your people um, to worship you, um, that we would be um, willing to understand what you teach, to conform ourselves to it, um, and to delight in your truth. Lord, not only to follow it um, in some sort of hard-hearted or begrudging obedience, but Lord, help shape our affections according to what you have spoken. Help us to love your law and delight in your commandments. And so, Lord, be with us in these things. Help us to have understanding and help it to be edifying um, to the saints. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into our text this morning. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we are going to be looking at verses 26 through 35. I've enjoyed how much time we've been able to spend in 1 Corinthians um, during this iteration of what does the Bible say about. So let's jump in. I'm going to begin reading verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 14. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at most three, and each in turn, then someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. And let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And particularly the section we're looking at, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, 
Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. This is God's word for us to consider this morning. As we begin working through this handout, the first thing we want to consider is just the explicit exposition of what um, the Apostle Paul is saying under the inspiration of the scripture. Um, Just looking merely by way of outline, what are the points that he's making? And I wanted us to begin, as we looked at this, um, by beginning in verse 26, because I really think it helps set the context for what he says, particularly about women speaking in the gathering, because the whole section opens up about who should be speaking at all and what should be their conduct while they're speaking and what's appropriate speech and inappropriate speech within the gathering. And so really that instruction to women taken in an isolated form, I think does miss the broader context of what he's talking about here. He's talking about orderly worship and particularly um, within that first context of verses 26 through the first half of verse 33, it being orderly, it being discernible. One of the problems there was that their worship was just chaotic and their exercising of the spiritual gifts. They they were speaking in tongues and prophesying at this time um, in church history. And they were doing all these things, but it was just madness. You go into church and everyone's speaking in tongues and no one's interpreting and no one can understand what's going on, right? One of the things the apostles trying to teach them is, hey, We need to have our worship be decent in order and needs to be understandable in order to be edifying. If everyone's just shouting out, no one knows what's going on. No one can learn. No one can discern. You guys are just trying to use your spiritual gifts to kind of show off, but it's not actually building up the body. I think there's an important lesson here in this. The spiritual gifts are always for the building up of the body. If we are exercising them just for our own benefit, That's not the purpose of those giftings. The reason God gives gifts to his church is to bless the church, Um, but they weren't using them in that fashion. And so there was chaos. There was a lot of disruption in the service, and he's exhorting them. Hey, God is a God of order. He's a God of understanding. You should be doing so and things in an understanding way. And then there's even a part of that as people were prophesying that if you noted that people were to then question that prophecy, to ensure that it was sound or people were speaking in tongues, then someone would come in and interpret. And part of that context is going to make sense of some of what we read um, in this section regarding women being silent in church. Now let's jump in explicitly to the section we're looking at, which is the, fir- or the second half of verse 33 through verse 35. Let's jump back in and read from there. It says, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. So it opens by making just the very clear, straightforward statement that women should keep silent in the churches. I think it's worth noting, going back to the talk that we had on head covering there, where it talked about women praying or prophesying, Here in the context of prophecy in the local church, Paul is saying women ought not to speak but are to be silent. That's why um, back in 11 I said I would interpret that prayer prophecy just to be a cynic dote for their corporate worship because then just a few chapters later he makes clear that women are not to be prophesying within their corporate gathering and you have to harmonize all the scripture to understand there not to be any contradiction within it. So here he says that women are to keep silent. The church's prophecy was not something they were to be exercising um, within um, the corporate gathering. And then he goes on to say, for they are not permitted to speak, but, so what does he contrast with this being silent and not speaking? He said that's one end contrasted to that. Rather than speaking, he says they should be in submission. And then he says, as the law also says, So what is he doing here? In in this verse, he's reaffirming um, the command that they are to remain silent. Then he explains this silence by saying, by contrasting it, by saying, as opposed to speaking, that they are to be in submission, meaning they are not to be in authority, but rather under authority is what he's getting at there. And then he defends their silence by saying, as the law also says, Now, some people will debate, what law? If the law says this, what law is Paul here referring to? And different commentators have speculated different 
things. I think the most explicit, though, is just going back to Genesis 3.16. That's the view that at least Matthew Poole took along with a few other commentators I read. In Genesis 3.16, going back to the curse given to the woman, just says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Just saying that there's a God-ordained order and that that's what the law of God testifies, and thus women in the corporate gathering should submit to that order that God has established in the world. So he opens by saying women should keep silent in church, not permitted to speak, should be in submission, as the law also says. Then he goes on to say in verse 35, he says, if, if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. All right, so first he says, they have basically, to paraphrase, if they have a question, rather than speaking that question, they should ask their husbands later at home. And then he says, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. What is the reasoning behind asking the husband at home? Well, I think just in the same way as Paul here is exhorting the worship and the corporate gathering of God's people, the family of God being orderly, so too he's reaffirming the order that God has prescribed as well for, for the home and the spiritual headship of the husband over his household. And thus, rather than interrupting the corporate service with that question, ask your spiritual head when you get home later by asking your husband is the a application of what he's saying. And then he says, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So three times now he's used this silence sort of command here. One explicitly, then he repeats it again. Then he gives a contrast to that. And then he says it again by saying, for it's shameful for her to speak in church. Matthew Henry's definition of shame in this verse, because I think typically, especially in our day and age, virtually everything I've just said is offensive, but particularly the word shame is offensive, right? People don't be like, what? Why, why would he be saying that's shameful? I think Matthew Henry's definition of shame in his commentary speaking on this passage is really helpful, though. He says, shame is the mind's uneasy reflection on having done an indecent thing. It's an uneasy reflection on having done an indecent thing, meaning it, it's not proper. And you have that personal conviction that what you did was not proper. He goes on to say, Matthew Henry is commentary speaking on this verse. He says, and what more indecent than for a woman to quit her rank, renounce the subordination of her sex, or do what um, in common account had such aspect and appearance. Now, in saying all this, for many, you'd say, well, that doesn't help at all. That only seems to clarify what seems very offensive. Well, what else does the Bible say about this? I think there's one other verse that we should look at that's connected to this passage, also written by the Apostle Paul, and a very similar teaching that if we don't hold them in conjunction, um, I think we miss out on some of what is being intended here. So flip over in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look at that as well as we look at verses um, 8 through 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. First and Second Timothy and Titus are often referred to as the pastoral epistles. They're written that God's people, particularly um, the leaders of the church, would know how to conduct the church um, for the glory of God. And what does he say here? Again, instructing how God's people are to worship. It says in First Timothy chapter two, verse eight, "I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling." Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a tr transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in the faith and love and holiness 
with self-control. Now, last time around, as we did a What Does the Bible Say About, um, one of the questions submitted was female pastors. And I particularly just exposited this section for that. Um, and there's a number of interpretive questions that we're not going to dive into this morning on this particular passage. But there is some consistency with the passage that we looked at that I at least wanted to highlight in there. First, we see him say in verse 11 that women were instructed to learn quietly with submissiveness. Almost an exact quote of what we just read in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 12, he says, women are commanded not to teach or exercise authority. And how does he contrast that? Notice in 1 Corinthians 14, there's a contrast. Quiet versus being in submission. Here, he contrasts teaching exercise and authority with being in submission. So he uses the same sort of contrast language between the two and verse 12 of 1 Timothy 2. And then in verses 13 and 14, roots these things, um, going back into the, the way the differences between the sexes going all the way back to Adam and Eve and the original fall into sin. All right. So now that we've looked at those controversial verses and talked a little bit about what they're teaching, what is our basic interpretation of these things as a church? And as I opened in the introduction, I don't think that the interpretation of these passages, at least on a broad level, is all that difficult. I think it's fairly simple. I think it's in the particular applications that it gets difficult. Let's look at the broad level interpretations. The first is, I think that this is clearly teaching that men will lead the public teaching and offices of authority. That men are to lead the teaching in the church and are the ones that ought to hold offices of authority within the local church. And I think that's clearly the contrast here that's going on between, again, speaking and submission or not exercising authority and being under submission. The idea is that God has order, and in that order, he designed the men to lead. Um, and with that, the second point that follows from it is that women will gladly come under that leadership. I think that's the explicit part of this. They're not going to try to challenge or, or try to assert themselves in that position of authority. But I understand God has ordered for men to lead in some of these things and for us to follow in some of these things. And we're not going to buck against God's design, but we're going to gladly come under God's design and see it as a good blessing, all right? So those are our first two points. I think that general principle is very simple, but then it leads to two explicit questions, I think, necessarily. And actually, one of these questions was submitted alongside this topic when someone filled out the card. They says, what does the Bible say about women being silent in church? And then said in brackets, are, does this mean they're not allowed to sing? Okay, so even the person that submitted this question asked one of these questions, but I think both of them are important to address. The first is, can women ask questions in mixed gatherings? So let's say, for example, during this time, during Sunday school, often at the very end of Sunday school, we'll have a Q&A time, or maybe you're at a Bible study that's a mixed group in the Bible study. Is it appropriate for women to ask questions, or do we take what 1 Corinthians 14 says and say, well, if they have any question, they should really just wait till they get home, ask their husband there, and not pipe up within the mixed gathering, right? I think that's a real genuine question to wrestle with as we come to this text. What is it teaching? Well, my answer to that would be, let me find my place in my notes here because I lost them. Yes, but a qualified yes, okay? So can women ask questions in mixed gatherings? My answer would be yes, but a qualified yes. I think the context of 1 Corinthians 14 does not directly apply to our context, and that is important to wrestle with, at least in the initial level of interpretation, which is why I would say there is times when it is appropriate for a woman to ask a question in a mixed audience. Why am I saying that? Because as we started reading in verse 26, we see that the whole context of what's going on there is people are prophesying and people are speaking in tongues, and thus the conversation or the discourse that's being described here amongst the women is either the interpretation of tongues or the questioning of prophecy. And I think both of those things, it would have only been appropriate for men to do in the corporate gathering. But we're a cessationist here. We don't believe that we are prophesying in 
the gathering, and we don't believe that anyone's speaking in tongues in the gathering. And so explicitly what was going on in their worship was a context that is different than our context. When men teach in our church, they're teaching, but they're not teaching in the same sort of prophetic way as thus saith the Lord. And thus, in our worship, when's the last time during a preaching, a, a man in the congregation stood up and started questioning the preacher, right? That's not the sort of thing we do. That was what was going on in Corinth, okay? They were having that sort of dialogue in their worship based on the setting of where they're at in church history. They were in that stage while all those gifts were still operative in the local body. So the whole context of what's happening here is different. I think it's helpful to at least initially acknowledge that and go, yes, I don't think it would be appropriate for women to question prophecy or to interpret tongues in the corporate gathering, but I don't believe that we're doing those things now anyways. Um, and so the explicit teaching here is a little bit different than what um, is going on, say, when we have a Sunday school lesson or a Bible study. So I think there is a category of biblically appropriate questions women can ask in mixed gatherings that are not in violation of this principle, especially when the woman is clearly seeking to just understand. Are women allowed to come to church to seek understanding? Of course they are, right? Especially if, what if you have a single woman in the congregation who's unmarried and doesn't have a godly father? Where, is she allowed to ever ask questions? Is she ever allowed to seek understanding in an appropriate fashion in any mixed audience? I think there is a time for that. And so I wouldn't want to be hard-lined and say, no, there's never a time when women can ask a question. But if you notice, I did not answer that question yes. I answered that question with a qualified yes. So what's my qualification? Well, I think there's a few that I'd want to give regarding what Paul is teaching here. First is um, because when questions are posed to undermine or challenge the teaching, I don't find that to be appropriate for women to be, for example, trying to debate the pastor or debate whoever's teaching in a public teaching setting. I think that is a job for the men of the church. The men should be those ones who stand up and defend the doctrine of the body. And if it's like, I'm not sure what their teaching is sound, I think that should be the men who are carrying the lead for that. And so what I'm not saying is that the teaching can never be questioned. But I am saying I think that should be on the shoulders of the responsibility of men who are called to lead and protect in the church. It shouldn't be the women's job to guard all the doctrine in the body. I think that is a responsibility of godly men to lead in that fashion. Um, and thus, I think men should lead in that. I do think there's a level of impropriety when the women are publicly challenging the leadership of the church in the mixed gathering um, that it doesn't create a healthy um, environment. And so in that setting, I would say no. I think that's where the men in the church, in particular the husbands, should step up. And it's completely appropriate for a wife to go to her husband, hey, when the pastor said that, what did you think? Because it sounded wrong to me, right? And then he's like, maybe you're right. Let me research that and dig into it or, you know, and then to approach it. And I'll just say there's been times um, where it's awkward where I've had um, wives argue publicly in mixed gatherings and then husbands come up after and like, actually, I agreed with you. And like now there's this weird dynamic, right, even in their own household because when a wife speaks, um, she does represent her husband in some ways. And so I think you just have to be careful with some of those things. Another time when I'd say when questions maybe are not appropriate based on what Paul is teaching here um, from women is when sometimes questions are really just veiled teaching. So Paul is very clear that women should not teach or exercise authority over men. And thus we would have men that lead the Bible studies, lead preaching, lead these different things. But some of you know that sometimes questions really aren't questions at all. They're statements, and they're used to teach. Um, and I think there can be a level of impropriety sometimes in that as well in the congregation when really the question is not a question at all, but it's meant, well, he left this out, and so I'm going to fill in, or he kind of got that wrong, so I'm going to make sure everyone knows the right answer. Um, and I think there can be an impropriety of that within the public teaching. Another way to think about this is when you're asking a question 
for the benefit of others, even though you already know the answer yourself. That's not actually trying to seek any sort of understanding. So what are you doing? You're doing it to teach, right? And so in as much as we wouldn't want someone up front teaching, I think it is worth wrestling with to sometimes maybe women try to subvert and kind of teach in an underhanded sort of way. I think that definitely does happen. So finally, some questions um, may be better saved for your husband in private, which is what he's teaching here, and we shouldn't um, be ashamed of that at all. And it's important, wives, to just understand that you do represent your husbands when you speak in corporate things. And thus, you have to say, if I'm saying this, would my husband heartily agree with this? And if he would, then maybe he should be the one saying it. And if he wouldn't, then maybe this is a conversation better had at home first, right? And so it is worth wrestling with those questions. So I give a qualified yes. I certainly would not want to say women are never allowed to ask a question. But it doesn't mean that every question is appropriate either and that there's not heart conditions going on that need to be seriously wrestled with as we apply God's word. Next question that is loaded but important as we come to this. Can women sing in the gathering? It's not just that they can, that they must. Okay? God's women are commanded to sing in the gathering. It's not a question of if they can sing. I would argue that they must sing. The church corporate, both men and women, including children, is instructed to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Thus, it is required of the women of God to sing in the worship of God. And that is clearly not as Paul is the one to give that instruction on multiple occasions, not Paul's intent when he's talking about women being silent in the church. They are commanded to sing in the corporate gathering. And I would offer to that as well, that when we do things like offer a corporate amen in our church, following a song, following a reading, is totally appropriate for the women to give a hearty amen to that as well. The silence is in reference to teaching in the gathering not in corporate participatory elements. That's why this silence is always contrasted with submission in both the examples of the scriptures we looked at. Because it's a matter of a teaching and authority, it's not a matter of just uttering a noise, registering a decibel. That's not the point of what he's getting at. The point is he's getting as this authoritative teaching within the gathering. So should women lead the singing? is another follow-up question that often comes from this. In other words, like up front, Sunday morning, at the mic, leading the singing. And my honest answer to this, as unsatisfying as it may be, is that I do think it's kind of a gray area, to be honest. Is a woman teaching or exercising authority when she's doing that? Because she has a, a mic in front of her. That's the first question. And my basic answer to that would generally be no. I don't think she is teaching or exercising authority. She's merely helping um, the rest of the people to get started and to get singing. Um, but the next question that you would ask in that is, is it proper for women to be leading men in worship? Um, and that, that's a little trickier question to answer, I think, biblically. I think the norm is certainly that men are, are leading in these things. But is it an explicit thing that's forbidden in God's word, um, I would not be willing to go that far. What I would say is it's not ideal. I think it's ideal when men lead the worship, lead the singing of God's people. I think it's a good thing to work towards. Um, pragmatically, men have a far easier time singing when men lead. Um, it's just an undeniable fact that the men in the congregation sing better when a man, a man is helping lead it and thus to promote congregational singing i think there is a benefit to it but does that mean it's sinful to ever have the mic mic female vocalist um, i'm just not willing to go that far um, i will say we have intentionally attempted to have men lead our singing here recently and it has been a blessing so i i would say it's ideal uh, we've worked towards that um, but i'm not willing to call it a sin for a woman to ever be have a mic in front of her while singing in the congregation either. So what are some applications to draw from this? Some of these are just matters of church leadership and principles that we follow. But what I wanted to lean into at the end of this talk is how do we personally apply a teaching like this 
as we're seeking to be righteous in the household of God. And to begin by talking to the men, um, men, I would just say that you must be willing to lead. That is part of God's call in this. Men, you must be willing to stand up. You must be ready to lead both in the congregation and in the home. Does that mean it's every man's job to be a preacher? No, it doesn't mean that. But every man, especially who has a family, is called to be a spiritual leader. And thus, we need to be willing to step into positions of responsibility. If God has called us to these things, we should take that as a high and noble calling, both in the congregation. And then note, when Paul is saying to women to ask your husband later at home, then whose job is it to teach her when they get home? The husband, right? What if she gets home and asks her husband? He goes, I don't know. Why don't you ask the pastor? Right? So, it, like, if, if the woman is actually going to go through and follow through with this, what's the necessary implication? That the men in the congregation are willing to take up that mantle of spiritual leadership. It's incredibly important. Listen to what Matthew Henry says as he's commenting, speaking to men on this text. He says, note, as it is the woman's duty to learn in subjection, it is the man's duty to keep up his superiority by being able to instruct her. If it be her duty to ask her husband at home, it is his concern and duty to endeavor at last to be able to answer her inquiries. If it be a shame for her to speak in the church where she should be silent, it is a shame for him to be silent when he should speak and not be able to give an answer when she asks him at home. Great quote from him. And men, we must realize in any of these sorts of teachings, there's one impulse to hear any of this and to take a chauvinistic sort of proud puffing out your chest of like, yeah, we have authority. But guess what? In God's word, authority carries with it responsibility. If you have that authority given by God, that means you also have a high calling and responsibility given to you by God. So men, this is not merely some privilege to take lightly. It's a responsibility that I believe every man is going to answer for on the day of judgment. How did you lead? Did you lead in a Christ-like way? Were you ready to give an answer to those in your charge? I was saying this too, men. It's very appropriate if your wife asks you a question you don't know, to say, I don't know, all right? This is not a call to just feel the need to have every answer at every moment. I don't do that. I study for my sermons, right? I don't just show up and wing it. Why? Because I want to be prepared. Same way if a, a question comes up in the household that I'm not prepared to answer, it's okay to say, I don't know, but let me find out and then actually find out, right? and then actually seek to answer the question, not to just leave it hanging. So it's not a call to know everything all the time, but we must take that, spans that mantle of responsibility to lead and to work hard to be prepared for the task God has called us to. The second application that comes from this is that women must learn quietly in the congregation. A few things I think that are important to highlight in this is the instruction that Paul gives women in corporate worship is actually not some peculiar instruction to give to women, but is actually a description of godly femininity throughout the scriptures that also bears weight in the congregation. How is it that women of God are described? When well, 1 Peter 3, 4, speaking of the wife, he says, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious, Right? Women who ordain themselves with this sort of gentle and quiet spirit in their conduct, who are calm, who are not, don't feel the need to be the center of attention, who don't feel the need to always have their voice heard, are spoken of as a godly attribute. Whereas the woman folly in Proverbs is described repeatedly as being the loud woman. This is what it says in Proverbs 7, 11. It says, she is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Or in Proverbs 9, 11, the woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. So I say this merely to say this is not an arbitrary command, but this is actually a natural command that women are to be more gentle. That's part of their nature. That's why God made them nurturers, being able to have children and care for them. It's a nurturing aspect that is part of their glory 
And it's a godly thing. Now, does this mean women are silent at all times? No, it doesn't mean that. I'm not even saying that they're silent in the decibel range level, even when they're at church. But when God calls women at times to be quiet, that's not an abnormal calling. It's actually a consistent thing with how he designed them. Now, as I say this, I want to be very clear not to be hard on the ladies and particularly not to have like a judgmental look at any woman who has ever not displayed this wonderfully. In as much as the things that are being commanded here, I do believe are part of God's good creation design. What's being commanded here is explicitly difficult in the scriptures. In fact, it's unnatural given our fall and sin. I think it is natural in the way of God, how God designed the sexes, but it's unnatural given our propensity towards sin. It's tough. Women, it's not going to be easy to do this. And going back to that law of Genesis 3.16, the desire is to be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. That, that power struggle is a result of sin, and it's something to continually be worked through as a Christian. Because guess what? The temptation doesn't go away to sin when you become a Christian, right? It's that desire to be in a place of authority that's not given to you by God is always difficult. And so I say this to the ladies and say, this is hard. You're not going to be perfect at all times. It's not as if, I think sometimes this is portrayed in such a way as some women's personality type is just good at this and other women's personality type struggles with this. Like, oh, you're, you're a type A boisterous sort of woman, so this is hard for you, but if you had a different personality profile, this would be, be easy for you. And it's true that every person struggles more or less with different sins, but I think every woman will struggle with this, despite her personality. It's just difficult in a fallen world. And it's helpful to just acknowledge that. And it's helpful also to acknowledge that the things advocated in Scripture on these matters are just completely foreign to a culture that's awash with feminism. We, both men and women, are fish in a feminist ocean talking about what it would be like to walk on dry ground. When we read stuff like this, it's like otherworldly. What are you talking about, Paul? This is crazy, right? Because we have just been so inundated with a philosophy and a worldview of what's appropriate and what's normal that we need to actually be challenged to have our minds be renewed by what God has spoken in these matters and to embrace the teachings of what we're looking at today as a process of sanctification, not a rigid set of rules that get implemented, right? So it's not as if like all these things are going to be clamped down on and we're never going to have any problem with this ever again. No, rather it's, no, I want to be more and more transformed into God's word has me to be. I want to grow in these matters. And it really is a process, but it's going to be a tough one. But in saying this, women should not fight biblical order, but should come under it gladly, seeing it as a good gift of God. Final thing I want to say, both for this text and really as a kind of summary to this um, study we've been doing on what does the Bible say about, and that is we should not apologize for Scripture. We should not apologize for Scripture, especially these verses that make cultural hairs on the back of necks stand up. Okay? This is the Word of God. This is what God has spoken. This is not the wisdom of man that we're reading. This is the wisdom of an inerrant, holy God who has chosen to make His revelation known to us. It's easy to say that God's Word is great. It's easy to say God's ways are better than our ways. But you get to texts like this, and, and is the rubber actually going to meet the road on that? It's easy to have this lofty view of Scripture, but what about when you get into the weeds? Are we genuinely going to believe that we're not more enlightened than God is? Because that's often what the rub is. Well, yeah, but that's an old book. Don't you know? We've come a long way. It's 2024. God's ways are better than our ways, and they always have and they always will be. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
My goal in this series is not to major on the minors, as maybe it's, it's felt like at times. Um, you may disagree with some of the topics we've covered, whether it be head covering or spiritual gifts or the Nephilim or particular gendered piety in some of these matters. I'll just say particularly with head covering and the Nephilim, we are not going to divide over those issues. I don't know if that disappoints any of you. It's not going to become a formal doctrine of our church. That's just not what we're going to do. But in saying that, all of the word of God does matter. That's why we do a series like this. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to have any problem passages in the scripture. We don't want to say, I affirm the Bible except chapter whatever. And thus, there's times when we're even getting into the weeds of tertiary doctrine where great brothers and sisters in a local church can disagree with each other and still be in fellowship, even when we're in those matters, we shouldn't say, thus it doesn't matter, right? We should still be seeking for unity of mind, seeking to conform ourselves to the Word of God, wrestling with the difficult ones, and doing our best to apply it, even though we understand that we're finite men and women and we're probably going to make mistakes along the way, but we shouldn't give ourselves an excuse to just say, it doesn't matter. Because what part of Scripture doesn't matter? Show me the chapter. Show me the verse. It all matters. Does it matter equally? No. Denying the resurrection matters a whole lot more than your ultimate opinion on the Nephilim. Okay? So it doesn't matter in the same way, but we can't say that it doesn't matter because it's God's word revealed to us. As Douglas Wilson, the pastor, says, well, we should have no problem passages. That's true. We should have no problem passages. I, my system of theology works except for that section. I don't know what to do with that one. We should seek to actually try to understand all of it, agree all, with all of it, knowing that we're going to make mistakes along the way, being humble, but we should seek that out. And that's why we do this series. It's easy to say you love all the Bible, but to avoid the tough parts. And one of the reasons why a lot of these sorts of questions do come up is because often pastors just want to skirt the edge of it because they know it's going to be offensive and potentially divisive, and they don't want to deal with the emails. And I will just tell you, it's not always fun to be a guy up here like, I'm going to walk away and half the room is going to disagree with me, right? That's not always fun. And that's why you avoid it in your sin, right? But as a Christians, we need to be committed to the full counsel of God's word and do our best even when we know um, that people might potentially disagree with us. So when we study God's word, may we cheerfully conform our thinking and our actions to it. And may we be gracious with others, knowing that the process of interpretation and application of scripture is a process. It's a work of sanctification. We're not all there yet. I'm not all there yet. But by God's grace, may we continue to seek out what does the Bible say. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for this series. And God, I thank you for the caliber of questions that were submitted. Lord, it's clear that your people have a desire to understand your word and that they have an aptitude to know what some of those difficult questions are as they're studying it. And so, Lord, I just thank you for the work of sanctification you're doing in our congregation. Lord, I pray as we study the hard parts of Scripture, you'd be unifying our minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, we know that this side of glory, there's never going to be perfect unity, that there's always going to be trials and debates. But Lord, I pray by your grace, as you're building and sanctifying your church, that you would move us closer to that point of glory, that you would move us closer to that unity of mind, that you would grow us in our Christ-likeness and our understanding of Scripture. So Lord, being fully aware that we might not fully arrive on these things, we pray that this year, this next decade, this next 40 years, would we move closer to that goal? And would you, by your grace, sanctify our church in that way? So, Lord, we lift these things up to your care. We pray that you'd be glorified in our worship here in just a few minutes. And, Lord, I thank you so much for this congregation and what a blessing they are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.